What's up everybody, Mike Lazarecki here, and today we're gonna to be going into my review of the Zcam E2S6, and uh, yeah, it's gonna be an interesting ride, so let's get into it. All right, so before we get started, I wanna do a quick shout out to anybody who's a new subscriber to this channel. Over the past month, we've gained about 11 new people, so I'm happy to have you on board. If you're not subscribed yet, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button, and uh, yeah, let's get started. So the Zcam E2 S6 is a small 6K capable cinema camera that's positioned to disrupt the market because of its affordability, its premium appearance, and its substantial feature set. Standout features on this camera include its capability of recording cinema 6K, 5K at up to 75 frames a second, 4K at up to 120 frames a second, all of those at 10-bit. Speaking of 10-bit, recording modes include H.265 at 10-bit 420 internal recording, also 4K 10-bit raw internal recording, ProRes, ProRes LT, and ProRes HQ all internal as well. All the internal recordings can be recorded to a CFast 2.0 card, or you're also capable of recording via USB-C directly to an SSD. This is a feature that I really love on some of these newer cameras because it makes the workflow so much nicer. You can record directly to the SSD and then edit directly on that same hard drive. So that's a really cool feature and I'm hoping that that becomes more of a standard across all camera brands. Other standout features on this camera include a cinema style locking EF mount, plus a wide variety of different connections on the back of the camera, including things like a breakout XLR connection and a full size HDMI. So if you guys watched my unboxing video for the Z cam, you'll remember that there was really not that much in the box. It was basically the camera, two cables, and a Wi-Fi antenna. And that was literally everything that was in that box aside from the foam packing. On top of that, the camera itself is extremely minimal. It's basically a sensor in a box with some connections on it. So let's get into the physical workflow and usability with this camera based upon some of that. Now, as I've been using the Z cam, the sensor in a box style design of it seems like a really great idea from a customization standpoint, but in practice it kind of comes out to be a little bit of a pain in the ass. And let me explain why. The setup time for this camera is as it should be expected to, since it's a cinema camera, a little bit more than what you would have with a mirrorless camera or maybe something like a Blackmagic Pocket 6K where you can kind of pop a battery and a memory card in, pop a lens on, and go. With this, you need to make sure that you make a connection with some kind of power source. My suggestion would be to use the Sony NPF style batteries that it natively accepts. The nice thing about the Sony NPF batteries is they do come in different sizes, so you can kind of bring the size of the camera down or up depending on what type of shooting you're trying to do. The NPF batteries do kind of provide you the most flexibility from what I can tell so far. You also need to attach a monitor to this camera. so. I kind of mentioned in my unboxing video that if you do not have a monitor already and you're thinking of ordering this camera, definitely order a monitor along with it. I would recommend something like the Atomos Ninja 5. I have a 7-inch Lilliput monitor that I've been using with it, and truthfully, the size of that 7-inch monitor, although it's nice to frame up shots with, it's a little bit large for my tastes. So a 5-inch monitor would probably be my comfort zone with it. But yeah, you're gonna need a monitor no matter what you do. It has a little LCD screen on the top of it, but it's basically useless unless you're just using it to go through the menus. Now, once you get this camera all set up with the rig and the batteries and the monitor, and you put a lens on the front of it, you'll start to notice that that small compact body becomes a much larger beast, okay? So what's nice about it is that it does provide you with a very professional set of options. Some of those NPF batteries can actually be used to power your monitor at the same time as the camera, which is nice. I have a couple that worked really well doing that. However, if you are a person like me who has a tendency to go from a shot that's on sticks like this to putting the camera on a gimbal to possibly doing some handheld work, you might want to pump the brakes a little bit before you buy this camera. Because of the way the battery sits on the camera and because of how small the body is, if you're using a large-ish lens, like even something the size of a Canon 17 to 40 millimeter, the balance on this camera became very front heavy very quickly, even with a larger NPF battery installed. So if you wanted to switch to using this on a gimbal, you would probably want to use a smaller lens and a smaller battery to try to keep that center of gravity as close to the middle of this camera as possible. Otherwise, it becomes very front heavy. And in my 
experience really difficult to balance on a gimbal. Now this becomes kind of important when you start trying to do handheld work because this camera sensor is not stabilized, much like the Blackmagic camera, which also does not have IBIS. And something to keep in mind with that is if you are trying to do more handheld stuff, you're either gonna have to try to bake the camera shake into the narrative of whatever you're shooting, or you're gonna have to try to find a way to stabilize the footage either in post or on a gimbal. Now I would venture to say it's actually easier to balance a Blackmagic pocket camera than it is to balance the Z-Cam just simply because of the form factor. Now moving back into some of that recording media, I like the form factor of the CFast cards, I just wish they weren't so expensive. Now on the other hand, I absolutely love the option to record directly to an SSD, as I mentioned earlier. Now as with any real cinema camera, this camera, when it's all rigged out, looks like a big interesting professional tool, which also has a tendency to draw people's attention. This is okay sometimes, but in other situations, you want to try to fly a little more under the radar. With the Z-Cam, man, that's really not gonna be easy to do, especially considering almost every use case I can see for this camera is gonna require a monitor, unless you're trying to monitor things wirelessly through the app, which does have some lag to it. So you're not gonna be able to react to things quite as quickly as you would through a monitor. You're also pretty much always gonna have to have a cage on this camera unless you're just mounting the box onto a gimbal. And at that point, again, you can't really see what you're shooting without a monitor. And you're gonna have to put a much smaller Sony NPF battery on there so you don't throw the weight front to back of the camera off. Now you would think that using an NPF battery that's larger on the back of the camera to help to counterbalance the weight of the lens on the front of the camera might be a great option. However, then you end up with this very long cinema camera that doesn't really work on most handheld gimbals. I understand that this sounds a little bit negative and that's because some of it is a little bit negative depending on the way that you shoot. Now I understand that this is designed to be a cinema camera and we're going to get to my feelings on who this is for in a little while here but I do think that it's important to keep in mind that if you are a run and gun shooter you're going to want to really think about all these things before you go and spend your money on this camera. Now, moving into the image quality, I would say that the image quality coming out of this camera is by far its strongest trait. The overall image quality is extremely nice, colors look great, and it's a very flexible image to work with in post. Even if you're only recording in the H.265 rather than using the RAW capabilities, that H.265 file is very flexible in post, especially when using that built-in Z-RAW 2. They have a ton of dynamic range in there for you to play with in post for color grading. In fact, I took this camera with me to a friend of mine's wedding, and the first few shots I took with this camera would have been incredibly challenging for any camera with the highlights and shadows in the situation, and this camera handled it beautifully. Believe it or not, I didn't actually have anything that was fully clipping on either shadows or highlights in these shots. I was blown away when I got this footage back into my computer afterwards and saw just how much room I had to play with. So yeah, using Z-Log is where that 14 stops of advertised dynamic range really comes into play and shows you how much room you actually have. Additionally, I really like the color coming out of this camera. It really reminds me a lot of the Blackmagic film log look, so I do love that look and it really does it quite nicely on this camera as well. The camera also really handles high ISOs very well with minimal and fairly pleasing looking noise patterns. So if you are looking at picking up this camera for use in lower light situations, I think you'll be okay. It really does pretty well from the standpoint of the higher ISOs. Add to that the fact that the image stays sharp even at those high ISOs, I was pretty impressed. Once again, I would really put the look of the image out of this camera right up there with the black magic cameras and I love that look, so no complaints on that. Side. Now, on to the quirks and the issues. Let's be honest, there is no perfect camera. And to be truthful, this camera certainly has plenty of issues of its own. Now, before I get too far into this, I want to make sure that I mention and suggest that you watch another review as well from a guy named Gerald Undone. I don't know if you guys follow him, but if you do, he's got some great content. Uh, I will link his video right up here. In that review video, he goes incredibly deep into depth on the Zcam E2 F6, which is the full frame version of the camera that I'm reviewing and he finds quite a few issues and takes his analysis of those issues much deeper than I have. However, that video gave me some things to look for while I was reviewing this camera. I am delighted to say that some of the issues that he found in his review don't seem to be present on the Super 35 model of this camera. An example of one of the things that Gerald ran across with his copy of that model of the camera was that you might see a hue shift when changing ISOs. Now I tested mine from ISO 500 up to about ISO 20,000 
and did not see any noticeable hue shift. So that's a good thing. Additionally, he ran into some pretty serious audio syncing issues between the video and the audio in the clip, which also does not seem to present itself on the Super 35 model. Now I felt pretty good seeing that my copy of the S6 didn't show either of those two issues, but one issue that it did present that Gerald Undone ran into on the F6 is that if you are recording while your battery runs out, you will lose the entire clip from what you were recording during that power loss. You don't lose the file, but the file is so corrupted that it is unusable and unrecoverable as far as I can tell. I know he did some tests on some different softwares to try to recover the files. I did the same and there was nothing I could do to get that data back. So if you are recording something, I don't know, like for example, a wedding ceremony or a corporate thing that's more of an event-based deal, if you're recording a little longer piece of content and your battery runs out while you're recording, you have just lost everything that you recorded and you can't get it back, which means something that you can't recreate is not scripted, is gone forever. If this is a paid job, that's a huge problem. So I can see where there are probably some industries where that specific issue might not be that big a deal. If you are always in a controlled studio style environment and you have a team of people who can be monitoring the camera and making sure that you have plenty of power and your recording media is set up properly and you're not running the risk of running into that issue, you might be just fine. Or if you do mostly short takes and you're gonna start and stop recording frequently, okay, at that point, that might not be that big a deal breaker for you. However, someone like myself who does a wide variety of different types of shooting for both corporate type things along with weddings and other run and gun style documentary stuff, that is just an issue that I can't get past. To be honest, it kind of pisses me off because everything else about this camera that I could tell was something that I really liked and wanted to use, even with the additional workflow as far as the rig and the setup, I was willing to get past that because I liked the image so much. But I have to say that specific problem of file corruption due to battery loss is totally unacceptable. Now, the other issue that I have with this camera on a larger scale, since we're talking about the big problems right now, is the fact that since Gerald Undone saw those other two issues in the sensor on that camera, and I was able to test out that they did not exist on this camera, that means one of two things to me. One, the Super 35 model doesn't exhibit those two other issues because it's a different sensor, and that very well could be. Maybe the two different sensors that they're using in these cameras don't behave the same way under those different conditions. The problem with that is if it is in fact something that just was on the copy I had versus the copy he had, that shows that there's a quality control inconsistency coming from the company. That being said, if there is a quality control issue, that inconsistency doesn't make me feel comfortable in putting the label of this being my A camera for any kind of paid job, especially not with the file corruption issues. Now, other little quirks that I wanna mention while we're at it here, uh, like the menu system, it's easy to use, but it's a little bit clunky. There's some odd things that you have to do to kind of get certain stuff to work. For example, like to set up real overcrank slow motion, rather than like on the Sony cameras where you switch it over to S and Q mode and then you're basically in your slow motion mode, on this camera, you have to go through two separate menus and two separate steps to set your base frame rate. And then you have to go to a different menu to set what your actual FPS is gonna be. So I would have to set, I want this at a 24 frame rate base rate, and then go back into a different menu to say, I wanna shoot this at 75 frames per second. Now, along with that, if I change resolutions, I have to go back in and reset both of those settings again. That seems pretty clunky, and if I'm trying to do something as a one-man band, I'm gonna to have to go through a lot of settings to be able to do things quickly. Yes, you could set up some of those function buttons to do things for you that way, but uh, having to do multiple different settings in camera to be able to do slow motion is a pretty rough workaround in my world. Also, the cinema-style locking EF mount is a great idea, and I love how secure the lens is on the camera when it's in use. However, changing the lens as a one-man band, once again, is a little bit of a pain in the butt. And then the last issue that I really want to mention about this camera is that the RAW workflow, which I guess if you're getting into a cinema camera that you're planning to use a RAW workflow with, you should expect to have to do some extra steps to begin with. But 
their raw workflow with the Zcam is not as smooth as I would like to see it. Coming from actually using a Blackmagic 6K camera in the past, their raw workflow is extremely smooth and quick, and you don't really have to worry about the transcoding and rewriting the files. If you shoot in RAW on the Zcam, since their RAW files are not compatible with any of the NLEs that most of us use, you're going to have to go through their proprietary software to make whatever adjustments you need to make and then further transcode those files into either a ProRes or an H.265 file to bring into your editor to use through your edit that it almost makes it kind of pointless to shoot raw. Because when you're shooting raw, you wanna have all that flexibility. And like, for example, using Blackmagic B-RAW, you have the opportunity to use those raw files right in DaVinci Resolve without having to leave the software. It makes it a much smoother process. It almost feels like shooting raw with that camera isn't really a raw workflow. It's just another file type to use. With this, you have to go back through, make your adjustments, retranscode, export those files from a proprietary software before you can even start your edit in your normal editor. Now that's not to say that future versions of Resolve and Premiere won't have support for their raw file types, but as of right now, that workflow is kind of pointless in my world because trying to turn videos around quickly, I don't want that extra step. So on to my final thoughts about the Zcam E2S6. The Zcam E2S6 produces an amazing image. Honestly, it's one of the best images I've personally worked with. I love the look of it. After it's graded, it looks spectacular. I love how it holds the shadows and the highlights and you can really, really dial in your look without spending a terribly huge amount of time in post doing so, at least on the color grading side. And for the price point, I can definitely see why some people wanna use this camera. It's kind of like having a little miniature version of a RED that has more quirks and issues and doesn't cost $50,000. So for the price point, it's definitely a really great option if you're working in a studio environment or a much more controlled environment. But aside from that, it's really not a practical camera for anybody who's more of a run and gun shooter, especially from the standpoint of needing to rig it up and re-rig it every time you wanna change configurations it's going to put a strain on your workflow, especially if you are on a tight deadline or if the shoot time that you have is very small, you're going to have to make sure that you're set up before anything else goes on. If you need to throw the camera on a gimbal, you might as well just plan on having a second camera already on the gimbal. So who is this camera really for? Honestly, I think this camera would actually be a perfect match for someone who's working on an indie narrative film, projects where you have a crew, and a first AC and somebody who can help to keep these cameras operating ideally, that is a great option. Doing indie films where you have a little team, anything like that in a controlled environment, I do think this camera would be spectacular for. The image is great. You, you really get a lot of dynamic range out of it. On the other hand, I think that anybody who's a documentary filmmaker, a run and gun style wedding, event type videographer, this is not a camera for you. This is going to end up being a camera that creates a beautiful image, but everything else about the camera becomes a bit more of an obstacle for you, at least from an on-site workflow standpoint, especially if you try to go into recording into that raw mode, you're, you're playing with fire. You're gonna put yourself in a problem with your deadline because you're gonna spend a lot of time on your shoot uh, trying to get the camera set up, and then you're also going to spend a lot of time in post re-encoding what you already shot in order to edit it. So I would say uh, film crew, yes, they would love this camera because it's like a little mini red. Needs some babysitting, but it creates a wonderful image. Run and gun guy, I wouldn't do it. The truth is that I really wanted to love this camera, but unfortunately all the quirks and the inconsistencies between the different models and the different things that you run into problem-wise just make it not reliable enough for me personally. I know there are a lot of people out there that really like this camera. If you have the resources to devote to rigging this camera and keeping it operating optimally, I do think that you can make this camera into a fantastic A-cam. But for my personal purposes, not gonna happen. I don't think that this camera is gonna be a good one for me long term. Now with that said, I wanna make sure that I point out that it's not my goal to be bashing this camera. If you really like this camera, more power to you. Everybody's got a subjective opinion about these types of things, but I will say this, something that's important is knowing what works best for you. 
my goal with content like this is to let you guys know what I found with this camera in case you're a shooter who looks at things more like I do. This way you don't get stuck wasting your time buying a camera that may not work for your workflow. On the other hand, if you went through and watched this video and you decided that a lot of the stuff that I said were negatives isn't that big a deal to you, maybe this camera is really good for you. So don't shy away from giving it a try just because myself or Gerald Undone or anybody else maybe said something negative about it. There are plenty of people out there that love this camera lineup and you know use it pretty frequently. It just isn't quite right for me. So as always, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope you got something useful out of it. If you did, do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button. Let me know in the comments if you think that this camera is a great camera or what you think about the camera and what my findings were. If you haven't subscribed, please do me a favor and consider doing so. And I will see you guys next week. Later.